This episode is about throughness. Throughness in the dressage sense of the word, but also in the sense of going all the way through a training challenge. And maybe even in the sense of going all the way through any moment or challenge. Don't get stuck in the mess. On the other side of the mess is often something really beautiful. So here we go, episode 87, Going Through. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony. Because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Robert Frost said, the best way out is always through. Robert Frost has several things that he said that really relate well to horses. He was the one that said the quote that I love, uh, that freedom is when you're easy in your harness. Now in dressage, we talk about throughness, where that term is defined as an intangible concept which describes a horse moving freely through his entire body with no tension or resistance. So it describes a movement dynamic within the horse, but it also is a feeling between the horse and rider where the aids go through. So the rider sends their idea and their energy to the horse, and then that idea gets expressed out through the horse. There's a term in, in dressage called dressleshikait, which m- uh, translates to basically like through lettingness, or it's about a permeability. It's how well the aids flow through the horse. And this through lettingness <laughs> is something that can often be seen, but it can definitely be felt. And it's a result of excellent communication paired with balance and suppleness and willingness. So it's a complex thing and there's a lot of sort of circumstances and pieces that need to be in place for this to be expressed, especially in anything more advanced. But I'm actually not gonna talk about that kind of throughness. So what I wanted to talk about is the importance of moving all the way through a process or a training moment. This is so vital to training. So our goal is always that we ask the horse something, he does it, and then we thank him. But, you know, in training that doesn't always happen because by definition, we're in training, we're asking the horse to do things often that they don't yet know how to do. So often we ask for something we get something else. And there's a period of time where we're trying to navigate that quote unquote mess and get to the goal. Now, mess is not necessarily a negative thing. It's just a normal part of the process. And of course, we're trying to minimize the messiness of the mess and get through it as efficiently as possible and checking ourselves and saying, is there any way I could make this clearer? Is there any way I could ride this better, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's good to acknowledge that there is this moment where things aren't perfect and that's normal. However, I often see students, riders of any kind and any level, getting stuck in that messy moment for a little too long and maybe for not the best reasons. And I often see horses then, of course, getting stuck in that messiness too, right? The student's asking, it's not working, everybody's stuck. And often I think students are almost expecting some things to be hard, right? They they know that they're students, they know that they're learning, they know they're in new territory, And they, you know, expect it to be hard. 
And I hear a phrase a lot. You know, I'll, I'll hear students say, I'm struggling with fill in the blank. So I'm struggling with my candidate parts. I'm struggling with lateral work. I'm struggling to get my position right. I'm struggling to get the basic yields, whatever it is I'm struggling with. Don't struggle. <laughs> I mean, really, don't include struggle as part of your life, especially as part of your horse life. Do you know what the word struggle means? You guys know me. I love to look up words in the dictionary. Well, on Google. So as a verb, struggle means um, to make forceful or violent efforts to get free of restraint or constriction. <laughs> and as a noun, a struggle is a forceful or violent effort to get free of restraint or resist attack. <laughs> so when you look at the definition of the word struggle, I don't think there's any need for force or violence. Hopefully no one's attacking anyone. <laughs> there's no attacking going on anywhere in your riding experience. Hopefully not in your life experience either. So I'm going to tempt you to stop saying that you're struggling with anything. But the truth is, you're likely in a position where sometimes you're not getting the things that you're asking for. And that's going to require some curiosity, some focus, and some dedication to remedy that. But maybe instead of saying, I'm struggling with fill in the blank, you can say, I'm still practicing fill in the blank, or I'm still playing with how to do canter departs better. I think that feels a lot different. When you struggle, you get stuck in the moment of the mess. And we want to go through the mess and come out the other side. This is when it's so important to be able to get really specific on exactly what you're trying to do. What exactly do you want? What will success look like? And this part's really important, I think, is what's the essence? What's the most important part about what you want? And how will your exercise of choice help you achieve that specifically? And it's important to ask yourself, if you can't have it all, which is the thing that you do want or that you will accept? So if you're looking for, you know, three qualities at once and you can't have it all, maybe you're only going to get two out of those three, which two? <laughs> or if you only could get one of those, which one of those in this moment? And it's going to change moment to moment. But if you want a canter to part that um, is thinking forward that's at the moment that's on time, like at the moment of the letter, and that's really round and balanced, all right, if you can't have all of those for you and this horse in this moment, which two are more important? Which is more important? Sometimes you go, all right, it's not going to be at the letter. I'm going to go past the letter and do it whenever it feels right because the most important thing is that it's round. So you're working on your dressage test. You keep, let's say you keep missing that canter to part. It's late to the aids. So you ask, it doesn't happen. And then he gets bracy and then it's, in, you know, back, drops his back and it's plowing on the forehand. And so you keep practicing, coming around the corner, doing it at A coming around the corner, doing it A, and it's not working. And you might be tempted to say that you're struggling <laughs> with that candor to part at A. But then now that you've listened to the podcast, you'll say, you know, I'm still practicing getting that transition at right at A. Or I'm still playing with how to have a really nice round candor to part and put it at the letter. But if you find yourself staying in that mess too long, you can think, all right, you know, maybe you know what success looks like. The success looks like a perfectly round, beautifully balanced candor to part exactly at the letter right when you ask. <laughs> but 
But if you can't have it all, for you and that horse, which is the most important thing? What will you accept? Is it important that it happens right at the letter, good, bad, or ugly? Because you need that responsiveness then. And then if you have that responsiveness, then you'll be able to think about the balance and the throughness more easily. Or is it the other way around? Do you need a few more strides? Do you need another half a circle to really get the feel and make sure after coming across that diagonal with the lengthening at the trot, you maybe need more than just the time in one corner to build your coordination. And if you just could take a few more strides, you could get that really round transition and that's more important than putting it at the letter. So I don't know which one's right for you and your horse, but you need to think about it so that you're not tempted to say or feel like you're struggling. And another way to change, you know, change that, another reason why to change that phrase of I'm struggling with, it's, you know, doesn't that feel like it just holds you there? You're putting a big label on your head. I'm a person who struggles with candor to part today. (laughs) But if you say, well, I'm still practicing. Practicing sort of implies that if you practice it, it's going to get better. Or I'm still playing with how to get that really round candidate part at A better. So there's a little feeling of movement in those phrases. There's some, there's some solutions in there. The solution is practicing. The solution is playing with it in a way that it improves. Now, once you've decided, you know, if you can't have it all, what are the things you're going to accept? You can then start thinking, well, what's the easiest way to achieve that? You know, what's the easiest circumstance to achieve that my horse is more responsive to the aids? What's the easiest way to achieve that my horse is a little rounder and more balanced and through in those canter departs? Instead of doing it on the short side, you might go, let me do some on the circle for a little while because I really need that piece and I need to not be doing these sharp corners before and after. Or you might go out in the field for a second and tune up those canter departs. Just get them a little more responsive in a more inspiring area. So once you know the piece, what's the easiest way to achieve that piece that you want? What are all the different ways that your success might show up? So think also ahead in that spirit of If I can't have it all, what do I want? On the way to progress, there might be different ways that that might show up. For example, that horse that's a little dull to the aids, when you start tuning up the canter to part, he might like really jump in the air. He might like do a little playful buck in that process and kind of express and then snort out and shake his head a little bit. But that might be progress. And you've got to be willing to play with all that. But if you know that like, wow, I want my horse more exuberant. I want his back up. I want him to be really offering energy. Well, then if you think about that ahead of time, then you're going to accept a playful, releasing, you know, dolphin-y kind of canter part where he snorts afterwards and shakes his head because you're going to go, yes, now things are freeing up. It might be still just as bad a cantered part, <laughs> but it's sort of bad in the right direction. That's, the, that's a path out. That's a path through the problem. You've got to think about that ahead of time or ask your coach these questions. So you want to know, how are you going to know when you're heading in the right direction? So you're not just in the blind going, it's either perfect or I'm struggling. It's either perfect or I'm struggling. <laughs> Don't get caught. That's not the choice. It's not perfect or struggling. We're playing with it. We're pra- we're practicing. We're trying to find um, a breadcrumb in the right direction. And we're going to try to make it easy to get something going. So yeah, these are questions to ask yourself or ask your instructor or whoever you're learning from. Go investigate. See if you can figure out what the answers to those things are. And then When you um, look for help with that, you're going to get much better answers from someone if you ask. If you ask just, if you came up to me and said, how do I get great canter transitions 
on the short side at A. You know, I'm like, okay, well, let me think of every possibility. Well, I'll give you two answers. One would be just ride the corner and ask the right way at the right time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it'll work. You know, or I have to think of every possible, you know, way that you might be doing it so it doesn't work. And I'm going to have to give you a dissertation on each of those. But if you are able to get really specific and say, you know, it's late to the aids and then the horse is braced in the back. And I have a feeling that the most important part is that he's more responsive to the aids. Like, how, what could I do to help with that? Well, then I can give you a handful of exercises and things to think about and it'll immediately help you get through that Um that challenge. So let me give you another example. Uh, let's say you and your horse are just starting to learn uh, about lateral work, <laughs> famous for tying many students and horses up in knots. So let's say you want to do a haunches in. You want to master haunches in, or at least <laughs> be able to perform it. So I personally like to start lateral positions at the halt, It's tricky in some ways, but it's just really physically easy. It's not demanding. You get to stand there and really play with it. So I find it a really valuable exercise to do. So let's say the rider comes in and I say, okay, do you know what a haunches in looks like? That's the first step. You got to know what you're asking for. And if they do, I'll say, okay, halt in a haunches in and just make all the adjustments you need to make until you're in a haunches in. So they come in, they halt, they bring the haunches in, but they lose the bend, normal. So they get the bend, then they lose the angle, normal. <laughs> and then they get the bend and the angle, but now it's way too much angle. And then they get it right and we celebrate, yay, and we relax in that position. So success, right? They got haunches in. Well, yes, you got haunches in. That was the first step into the mess. Not the struggle, but the mess. But if that process that I just um, narrated, let's say it takes 45 seconds between when they halt and when they achieve the haunches in that they, the haunches in position that they wish they had found in the first moment. You know, imagine that takes 45 seconds. Now, imagine you're trotting how much ground you would cover in 45 seconds, right? You could go all the way around the arena in that time. So just being able to go and get that haunches in, I mean, we might celebrate. Maybe you and the horse have never done haunches in before. We'll celebrate that. But you are now in the messy middle and you have to keep going because otherwise that's just, it's always going to take 45 seconds. Right, so this is where the practice comes in. This is not where you go, I'm struggling with haunches in. No, you're not. You're practicing it. You're playing with how to do haunches in better. And you want to keep practicing and keep playing with it with intention and with focus and dedication until you can walk in and go one, two, three, boom, haunches in. And you're doing what I call first step, best step. It means the first moment you ask, you get the best result. I mean, that's, that's what we're going for, right? But you've got to get hungry for this. Focus, dedication, lots of practice. If you settle, you'll stay in, you'll, <laughs> if you settle, you'll stay in the struggle. That's a cute little, you know, put that on a little meme, except I told you not to use that term. So I guess I can't use that term. If you settle for less, you'll be setting yourself up to stay in the mess. <laughs> That even rhymes. If you settle for less, you'll be staying in the mess. So this might sound really obvious, but I find there's a certain um, subset of students that plans on struggling too much. They underestimate their abilities. They kind of go through a lot of this practice thinking, well, that's pretty good for me or that's pretty good for my horse. 
And there's so many things that are within reach that you can get to first step, best step. That you can feel like you've gone through the process so well that your horse actually is through to those aids, right? So throughness and going through the this process are really related. How do you have a horse embodying Drishlesi height, this permeability of the aids, this throughness, is because you practice putting the aids on and getting the result and shortening that time until it's like breathing. Aids come on, you get the result, and we all exhale into the result. You think about haunches in, ready, get set, and you're in it. I know, this is all what we're going for, but you can do this. And I think if the, there's these little mindset shifts, the mindset of not planning on struggling, just planning on practicing, and the mindset that you can get to that first step, best step, and that you can break it down. You can think about, okay, if I can't have everything, that haunches in. Maybe the biggest part of the haunches in problem was that when the haunches come in and then they lose the bend and the shoulders coming in, and you've got to say, you know what? The part that I'm having trouble with is not the haunches coming in. It's actually the shoulders staying out there and I'm losing the flexibility. My horse isn't flexible enough to bring the haunches in without the losing the bend or the sh shoulders staying out there. So then you take that piece and you say, well, how can I get that piece better? And what's the easiest circumstance for me to practice that movement, keeping the shoulders over to my outside hand? And then maybe you discover that that happens when you're leading the horse. The horse is always leaning their shoulders on you. And now you're hungry. And you're like, when you're leading your horse, you're thinking of that haunches in. And you're going to go in there and you're going to play with yielding those shoulders in a way what creates bend until you get first step, best step. Then you're going to go revisit that haunches in, and you're going to see if it takes 30 seconds instead of 45 seconds, and then maybe 10 seconds, and then maybe it's a breath. If you settle for less, you're going to be staying in the mess. I'll give you another example of going all the way through the process. So at a recent clinic, there were uh, a couple horses who were kind of green and very distracted and very externally focused. And they had a lot of trouble standing still or kind of being present with themselves. They're just, wow, you know, ears up, looking outside the arena and um, not really paying attention in, in the immediate space. So I have an exercise that I do often with horses like this, and I just make a little box out of jump poles. And the game is super easy. I lead the horse into the box. When they're in the box, everything goes light. Drop, you know, put a big loop in the in the lead or the line that they're on. I stand outside the box and I relax. And if they walk out of the box without moving my feet, hopefully, I yield them around, get them back in the box, and then I let go of them again. And this often, <laughs> who you know, repeats. <laughs> for lots of time, especially if the horse is really emotional. But if I'm consistent, because I know what success looks like, they get the game, they settle down, and they relax in the box. But only if we stay at it long enough to get through to that point. So when I'm doing this with students, I always point out that this might take a while. And so that when they're in that mess, I know they're not thinking, oh my gosh, I'm struggling, what's wrong with me, it's taking too long, and they aren't tempted to abort the mission because they think they're doing it wrong. It's like, this is what's going to happen, and it's going to happen, you know, we might be here a while doing this, I promise it'll be worth it, here's what it's going to look like when it works, here's what success looks like. And so I'll give them not only here's what success looks like, which is the horse is standing quietly in the box. You can be standing outside the box and they're making a decision to be there and they actually relax. And it, it can be a exercise where they actually end up feeling really safe. It's like their little, I call it the spa box, or you can call it the safety box or whatever you want to call it, the relaxation box. 
but it, re it works really, really well. But I tell them that the first thing that they might notice is that the horse stays in the box for a split second before he leaves. <laughs> That's progress. Or maybe he'll sniff the pole before he leaves. That's progress. Or maybe he'll just hesitate. Or maybe just put one foot over and see what you're going to do about it before he leaves the rest of the way. But to know that if you're getting any of those results, keep going. You're heading in the right direction. And we have to stay there long enough to get all the way through to the good stuff. If, if the student or whoever doesn't do it, that exercise with a strong intention, it's just a wrestling match. The horse can't stand still. The, riders, the person's trying to keep the horse in the box. You can actually do this riding or online. The horse is, you know, the, ride, the person's wrestling with their horse, trying to keep them in the box. They can't keep them in the box. And every time the horse steps out, they feel like a failure. And, you know, then the horse just feels more and more claustrophobic. The horse doesn't realize the point. And the whole, the whole purpose of it is gone. And, and all that happens is it's making things worse. It's annoying the horse. It's annoying the rider, the rider, the rider, or if they're on the ground, <laughs> the person. You know, they're all, everybody's getting annoyed with each other. The horse is getting annoyed with the person, the person's getting annoyed with the horse, and the person might be getting annoyed with me because I gave him this really boring exercise that's not working. <laughs> so sometimes doing things halfway can actually be worse than not doing them at all. So you've got to go through it. And if you're not sure and you're starting to doubt and starting to struggle, then you start to ask the questions. And that's where when people ask questions, then I can answer them. Nope, this is normal. See this sign and this sign. You're heading in the right direction. I promise it'll be worth it. Because I often find people doing this for a little bit. And then when I'm not looking, they, they don't like doing it. So they walk away. And I'll say, no, he's not through it yet. And then when they get through it, they're like, oh, that's the good stuff. Now, it's right about now that I feel like I need a little asterisk, footnote, sidebar. In saying, things, in saying it this way and in saying that you need to go through, I don't mean that you need to be bullheaded, stubborn, full of ego, that anytime you start something with your horse, you have to persist until your horse submits to it. So no, this is not what I'm talking about. Sometimes often we need to break things down into those smaller pieces. Sometimes we realize that maybe our brilliant idea for training that day is simply not going to work and we're going to need to cut our losses and walk away. There's plenty of times where I start an exercise and my plan is to go through it and then the evidence in front of me tells me, you know what, Usually this is the right idea, but today this is not the right idea. And sometimes you have to just stop, cut your losses, walk away. But often even then, we still need to move through it somehow. So unless it turns out that we made a really wrong decision or our horse is now unhealthy or unsound enough to do anything like that again, still want to kind of follow up and see how we can move towards some understanding or some sort of progress. It might look really different. But we still want to, there's a reason why we started that exercise. And sometimes you can keep the same intention, but have a totally different strategy. But again, this is where that curiosity and that dedication comes in. I wonder how else I can get this piece. So picking the right size pieces, knowing the essence of what we're trying to get through. And like I said before, if I can't get the whole picture, I'm pretty quick to choose just a part of the picture and get success there. Because, of course, we're not going to be perfect at everything all the time. <laughs> There's plenty of stuff that we can save for another day. 
But I guess the point is that if you think something is worth starting, it's often worth finishing. Even if the sort of flavor of how you do it is slightly different. I think most of all, the to, to know that the worst thing we can do, well, maybe not the worst, <laughs> but one of the worst things we can do is to leave our horses thinking, what the heck was that all about? So as much as possible, I try to avoid my horse going back to his pasture mates thinking, what the heck was that all about? So I ask myself this question, and maybe you'd like to try this yourself, is when you're when you're doing something and you picture, okay, when you're done with that and you put your horse back in his pasture and his pasture mates come up to him and go, hey, what'd you do today? What do you want your horse to say that he learned? And just taking a second to think about that can really help you make decisions. If you can't have it all, what's the one thing you want your horse to say that he learned? And if you break it down into a small enough piece, I promise you, you can go all the way through the process and get to the good stuff. Do not plan on struggling. <laughs>